What's up guys, today we're talking about bishops and 11 ways that you can use them more effectively. Hopefully these tips will help you get positions like what you see on the screen right now. All right, maybe not, but hopefully you can take away a couple of these tips and find ways to apply them in your games. Let's get started. All right, so the first way you can use your bishops, and this is one of the most obvious, but you can pin pieces. And the knights are particularly uh, easy to pin because all you have to do is just bring your bishop out to either g5 or b5 if you're white, g4 or b4 if you're black. And the last video on the channel, I talked about this from the perspective of if you're playing with the knights. So now I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, when do you want to pin if, you're, if you have the bishop and when do you not? All right, so the first thing to note is that when we play bishop g5, usually we are not trying to take the knight. So for example, if black plays bishop e7, we're probably not going to want to do this because we're simply giving up the bishop pair and we're really not getting any benefit from that. That just helps free up black's position. Now they have this bishop, they have both bishops, and if the position opens up, we're going to be getting into trouble. Okay, this is a, a common mistake that a lot of beginners do. They just like bring their bishop out, trade it off for the knight. I used to do this uh, when I was younger at times. I just thought that the knights were really cool. They were my favorite pieces, and so I was totally fine giving up my bishops for knights. And as I got better and learned that actually bishops are slightly better than knights a lot of the times, I stopped doing this. Okay, so you're not really going there to trade off for the knight unless you get some sort of extra benefit from it. So what do I mean by extra benefit? Well, here's an example. Let's just say black plays the move queen uh, d7. Not really a great move. And now if we take this, Black recaptures, and then we can take here, and what we've done is double isolated pawns, isolated pawns, we completely destroyed Black's pawn structure, and this is going to be um, a long-term advantage for us. We can attack these pawns in the future. And so this is an example where, yes, you do give Black the bishop pair, but we get something in return. Okay, so it's very different, very different than if we go back to this situation and we trade the bishop here. We actually get nothing good in return. Okay, so keep that in mind. You do want to take it at times if you get value from it. Another example here would be if black plays h6. Now would be a good time to take this because, again, if they take this way, we already saw what we can do, right? Give them the double isolated pawns. And if they take with the queen, well, now this is not defended enough. It's only defended one time, and we can simply win a pawn, right? So that's good enough compensation that we should give up the bishop for the knight because we're getting an extra pawn. Um, so those are the things you want to pay attention to. Those are the, the situations where you would want to give up your bishop. Otherwise, usually you're going to be going back. So for example, if black plays bishop e7, let's say knight f3 and now h6. Now again, we don't want to take it. We probably want to go back here. Okay, we could go somewhere else, but then we're just wasting time. Like if we go to f4, why did we go here just to come back? We could have just immediately went to f4. So usually if you want to maintain the pressure on this diagonal, you're going to go back to h4. Now, one thing about going back to h4 you have to, to think through is what's gonna happen if black plays g5? Does that benefit you or does that benefit black? So a lot of times in like, just just say here, this queen's gambit type of setup, a lot of times both players, generally speaking, will wanna castle king side. You don't have to, but that's usually what happens. There tends to be more tension in open files, uh, you know, on the queen side because of the c pawn. And so it's more risky to castle queen side. So because we know that most players usually castle king side, at this moment in the game, if black were to play g5, I would say that's probably not a smart idea for black because now what are they gonna do with their king? I mean, I don't think they really wanna castle here anymore, right? We've seen how this can be weak on the king, so uh, it doesn't really make sense that black would wanna do this. Now, that being said, if we were already castled here, well, then maybe it would make sense for black because then they could just uh, very quickly push these pawns and start creating threats on our king. Even if we're able to win a pawn, we have to be careful. Now there's maybe a rook on our king. That's the kind of thing that you want to think through before you want to think through this before you even play bishop g5 right because once you move there if this is turns out to be bad for you these pawn storms or the, the pawns pushing forward you know then you're gonna it's too late you're already wasting time and you're probably going to be in trouble at that point so before you bring the bishop out ask yourself those questions now in this case it's totally fine we haven't castled yet so we're not really worried about that and i think it would probably hurt black more than us so this is an example where i'm going to go ahead and play bishop g5 i'm not going to worry about it so here's another position where we've already castled and in this position i would really think twice about playing bishop g5 personally i wouldn't play this move because um you know now if black plays h6 what am i going to do i'm going to just give up my bishop for the knight don't really want to do that so i'm probably going to go back to h4 but then g5 is going to happen i have to go back and like i mentioned now black can even play h5 gambit this pawn if they want and they get a very nice attack knowing i have to go here only place for my bishop knight h5 can happen and there's quite a few threats on my pieces. Also, at some point, this rook's gonna come over and 
I'm just putting myself in a very risky position that I don't have to do, right? So in this case, I would say, you know what, back here, when I'm trying to make a decision, should I put the bishop on g5 or not? I'm going to say, you know what, I don't think so. Maybe I'll go bishop e3, maybe I'll play like h3 and then try to put my bishop on f4 and I can always drop it back if I need to, um, or, or even just rook e1, maybe d4 or something on the queen side, a4 or a3. Like there's lots of ways you could approach it. Personally, I'm not going to play bishop e5 here for those reasons. Now, if um, let's just say I played uh, rook e1 in black castles. Now I'm much more comfortable playing bishop g5 because I'm not so worried about h6 and g5 because now this is... Yes, it's kind of aggressive, but it's also weakening Black's king. So this seems fine for me. So that's, you know, you can see how whether or not you've castled and whether or not your opponent has castled really should come into your thought process and help you kind of determine, should I play bishop g5 or not? And the same kind of thing can happen on the other side of the board, although castling kingside tends to be a little bit more common. So those are things you want to keep in mind. I hope that made sense. All right, here's one more position. I want to ask you the question, would you play bishop g5 in this position or not? Go ahead and think about that for a second. And if you had a chance to analyze that, uh, my recommendation is yes, I would play bishop g5 in this position. Now, wh why am I playing it here? Well, first of all, I haven't castled yet. Okay, so I'm not really super concerned about this. Black could do it. And yes, they might gain some space. Uh, the other reason, and this is kind of the main point here, is that Black's bishop, which a lot of times bishop blocking is an easy way to stop the pin, that bishop has already been put in front of the pawn chain and can't go back there right away, right? So this pin is actually pretty annoying and i have the fact that i have knight d5 coming next move so as an example if black doesn't react right away and just sort of like casually castles they're already at a disadvantage now i can play knight to d5 the knight can't move or black loses their queen and how is black going to defend this knight well the answer is they can't really do it um stockfish says best move is bishop e6 then I can take here, and of course the queen can't take or we, we take it, so they have to recapture this way. And notice what happened to black's king. It's open, there's double pawns, um, and now I have you know something that I can work with. Maybe queen d2 lining up over here, maybe knight h4 letting the queen out this way, and potentially hopping into f5. Um, black's position has some serious problems. And all that happened because there was just no easy way to defend this knight, and I could just pile up on it. So if you see situations like that, uh, where black doesn't have an easy way to deal with the pin and you have a follow-up threat, that's when you want to go for it, usually. And one other thing while we're talking about pins, whenever you see your opponent's king and queen lined up on the same diagonal, you want to just check your bishop, see where it is, and see if you have a tactic available. Like in this position, bishop to b5 just wins the queen immediately because it's pinned, it can't move away, and uh, it's obviously defended, and black, in this case, can't do anything to block it. So you're just winning the queen. So keep an eye out for that. It's not super common, but always worth it to just check whenever you see the king and queen lined up on the same diagonal. Check your bishop. And sometimes there's a there's other pieces involved that you can use to, to make this work, but just keep an eye out for that. All right, the second way you can use your bishop is with the fianchetto. So instead of the sort of standard approach of moving one of your center pawns up and then bringing the bishop out somewhere here, uh, you can fianchetto it. And you play something like g3. This is common in uh, like King's Indian, the Larson opening where you play b3. There's lots of actually lots of openings where this happens, but the point is your bishop sits over here being kettoed and it monitors kind of the center of the board and the long diagonal, sorry, um, like this. Now, a couple of reasons why you would want to do this. Obviously, number one is it's very well placed. It's it's hard for your opponent to get to this bishop, right? Because of the way the pawns are set up, no knights can ever really attack that bishop. Uh, unless, of course, you move your pawn forward. But if you just leave it, knights can't really attack it. So the only way um, that your opponent can really get to this bishop is by using their bishop and queen and creating a battery. So as an example, um, these are not good moves. I'm just illustrating something. Setting up the battery like this, and then at some point when your knight moves, they can come down. That's how they can attack the bishop. But other than that, this bishop is, is nicely placed. Okay, so um, you'll see a lot of beginners. Sometimes they will even do things like uh this for example just being kind of both bishops right away and this actually isn't a terrible strategy this is uh you know not a bad place for your bishops um so this is something to keep in the back of your mind usually when this happens you have to involve one of your um either the c pawn or the f pawn and that is when things really break open so so this is very common in like the king's indian um let's just do an example here um a lot of times, you know, the move c4 can be beneficial. And what you're doing is undermining that pawn. Because once that pawn, um, let's just 
as an example, moves forward or whatever, you've opened the diagonal and that makes your bishop so much more powerful. And then you start to, and depending on what your opponent does, that's when your bishop becomes most effective. So keep that in mind. If you are going to fee and keto, look for opportunities to push this pawn forward. And really just, you're trying to undermine the pawns that are blocking the bishop so that it can hit some higher value targets. Okay, that's your goal. And that's what you want to look for. All right, next thing I want to talk about is the bishop pair. So the bishop pair, uh, if you can get the bishop pair against two knights, Usually that's considered as being up a pawn. Uh, now the exception would be if the position's completely locked up and there's like no open diagonal, that might be a little different. But let me just show you this kind of silly example, but black just brings their bishop out, takes the knight, brings the bishop out. By the way, this is a blunder. Um, if you want to pause the video, there's a tactic. I talked about this in the last video. You can look for that if you want. And if you had a chance to do that, bishop takes f7 is the move. And after king takes, you have knight takes e5. And black uh, actually can't take your knight because the queen. So they have to do something with their king. Um, and then you can take this with your knight and you're just winning uh, a bunch of pawns. So that's a little tactic. But let's just say you didn't even see that. And you just castled. And then black gives up this uh, bishop. So you have the bishop pair against two knights. And even though the position is basically equal at this point as far as pawns and, and everything else... Uh, Stockfish says white's just up a pawn, and it has to do with the fact that you have the bishop pair against the knights. And as the game goes on, um, ideally, if you're white, you probably at some point would want to play like f4 and just kind of open up some of these, uh, get, get rid of some of these pawns in the center. The bishop pair is going to be very, very strong. I mean, you can already see how like the bishops are controlling a lot of the board, and as the like I said, as the game goes on, that's going to get even more uh, powerful. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Don't just give up your bishops for no reason like we've already talked about. All right, the next way you can use your bishops is side by side. So we talked about this with the knights. Same thing applies with bishops. Let me just show you this random game here. Uh, and white ends up with two bishops side by side. And what you'll notice is how much of the board they cover. Look at this. And one of the disadvantages you might say about a bishop is that it only can control one colored square, right? So this bishop is always stuck on these white squares. Well, when you put the bishops side by side, uh, they cover everything. You got all the white squares, you got all the dark squares. They just cover a lot of the board. And this is very, very strong. You want to be looking for opportunities to do this. By the way, if you're wondering, when you do the two bishop checkmate, so two bishops and a king against a lone king, this is the idea that you want to keep in mind. You want to put your bishops side by side and they create this sort of V uh, that your opponent's king can't actually get out of, right? So you see how it's, it, the king is boxed in. There's just nowhere to go. Uh, that's because the bishops together can do that. If you only have one bishop, and like let's just say this bishop's over here, uh, you only have this, sorry, this diagonal here, the king can just walk through, right? Because you get all these covered, and then all these squares are not covered. But when you put them together, um, that's really where the power comes in. And then you can watch my video on this, but you force them back uh, and then push them to the corner and you checkmate. Okay, so keep that in mind. Bishops side by side are very strong and look for opportunities to do this when you can. All right, the next way you can use your bishops is by pairing them with your queen to make a battery. So a battery is just when you have two or more pieces lined up on the same uh, diagonal or file. You can do it with queen and rooks or two rooks. Uh, or a queen and a bishop. So like, for example, queen to c2 would be creating a battery and we're lining up on this h7 pawn. And if black doesn't do something, we're just gonna take the knight and then we're gonna take the pawn for free. Now this is pretty easy to deal with. Black can just play h6, kick our bishop away and probably aren't gonna wanna go there. Black can just move. But this can be useful depending on what's part of the board you're, you're doing it at. And also, uh, you can also flip it around. You can like drop your bishop back, let's say, put the queen on d3 and now you have the same thing except the queen is in the front and this is much more dangerous because now if black tries the same thing h6 guess what you take here and that's checkmate um so black's gonna have to figure out a you know another way to stop your plan probably 94 would be a good move for black but um still this is pretty dangerous and uh black has to be careful because if this knight ever moves you've got a checkmate um uh, battery lined up there okay so keep that in mind use your bishop with your queen to create a battery all right, the next thing you want to keep in mind about bishops is that usually you want your pawns to be on the opposite color of your bishops. Now, of course, that doesn't really make sense when you have both bishops, because how can your pawns be on the opposite color? But this a lot of times will apply when you only have one bishop left. Or sometimes if your bishop is kind of outside the pawn chain, you could still do something along these lines. But let me give you a good example here. This is an opening I like to play from time to time against the English bishop to b4 right away. And it's kind of weird because we're sort of um breaking some of the rules that i just talked about right but this one has a specific reason for why we're doing that so uh basically we give up our dark squared bishop 
And then we put all our pawns on dark squares. And so the principle that I just mentioned is you want your pawns to be on the opposite color of your bishop. Well, this is the only bishop that I have left. So what am I doing? Putting all my pawns on the other color. And even when you fee and kettle your bishop, that's kind of what you're doing, right? You're putting your pawns on the other color as your bishop. And you get protection. So like notice how the knight can't attack my bishop because my pawns would just take it. Um, so I've got everything defended there. And my bishop is still has maximum effectiveness, right? Because the pawns aren't blocking anything. I'm just, everything is clear for my bishop. That's kind of what you want to go for. And also, and this depends on what color your opponent's bishop is, but notice how this bishop doesn't really have much to do. So like, let's say the game goes on a little bit and uh, maybe we have this position, I don't know, maybe queen e7. Uh, what is this bishop going to do? Like, it can't really go anywhere there. It can go here, it can go here, but I mean, it's just like, it's not going to, be doing much these pawns are awesome right so so this is good to remember try to put your pawns on the opposite color of your bishops all right the next thing about bishops you have to remember is that they're only good in open positions okay if all the pawns are on the board blocking your bishops and blocking the diagonals their bishops are not going to be effective okay and there's certain particular openings you can play one of my favorites and i go to this example a lot is the danish gambit the whole point of the danish gambit is to gain time you get a lead in development but also open up the position for your bishops. Notice how these guys are lined up and this is a very dangerous uh, opening for black to play. They have to be very careful because there are lots of tactics that pop up because the bishops are immediately um, active and effective. And a lot of times, this is very common in chess, you have to sacrifice a pawn sometimes to do this. Here's another real basic example, but it's the modern defense where black immediately fee and kettles a bishop. And one of the common ideas here, I kind of mentioned this earlier, I think you play c5. And even though you're giving away the pawn for free, it doesn't even matter because the compensation that you get now from opening up this diagonal for your bishop is much more valuable. And also this pawn is pretty weak. You can usually take that back whenever you, you want. But the point is you have to open up the position. If you can't open up the diagonals, your bishops aren't gonna be very effective. If you can, they become extremely effective and give you lots of tactical opportunities. All right, the next thing I wanna mention about bishops applies in end games. And whenever you have a bishop against a knight in an end game, if the knight ever ends up on the edge of the board, it could be the back, the side, uh, any edge, if you can position your bishop like this, so bishop e5, notice how anywhere that the knight would like to move to is controlled by the bishop. You've completely shut down that piece uh, for sometimes permanently, like for the rest of the game, you just can't do anything. In this case, maybe if black's king could come around, but even the king is gonna have a hard time, uh, probably b6, and then maybe the king comes over and the knight could get away. But the point is you're uh, restricting the knight for quite some time and you can you know, use your king, do whatever you want, uh, your bishop is still controlling lots of squares and the knight just has to be stuck on the edge of the board. So um, this is a good one to, if you're playing with the bishop, keep an eye out for it. And if you're playing with the knight, watch out for this. You don't want to let your knight get, get trapped on the side of the board like this. But the next way you can use your bishops is through what are called discovered attacks. So a discovered attack is when you move one piece and then in this case, it's going to be this knight. The bishop is unleashed behind it. Okay, so in this example, if you want to pause and try to figure out what the best move is for white, go ahead and do that. And I gave you a pretty big hint. Uh, so if you had a chance to look at that, the move is knight takes e5. And what you're doing is creating a discovered attack on the knight, which also happens to be uh, a pin, in this case, on the rook. So if black tries to take your knight, you're going to take the, the rook, right? So this is extremely common. It doesn't have to be just in these fianchettoed uh, types of positions, although this is very common as well. When you move the knight somewhere and it unleashes the bishop to create a strong attack. But anytime you have a piece um that's blocking your bishop so like in this example this pawn we move it forward we create an attack now this is not as good of a move uh you know as i take c5 but you get the idea be on the lookout for those discovered attacks those are some of the trickiest tactics for your opponents to see and if you're paying attention a lot of times you can uh get into a really good position all right the next way you can use your bishop is when it's defended by a pawn so this is kind of a nice setup to pay attention to especially at the end of the game or really uh, whenever there's a hole, we talked about this a lot with the knights where there's no pawns that can control a particular square. It's really good to get a knight there defended by a pawn. Same thing applies to a bishop um, and you get the added benefit that the bishop defends the pawn. So they both kind of can just sit there and uh, that can be an outpost for your bishop. And because the fact, like I said, that there's no pawns that can attack it, it's very difficult for your opponent to chase it away. Um, so be on the lookout for opportunities. I couldn't think of a better example than this, but you know, just anytime you can put your bishop defended by a pawn where it can't be chased away by another pawn, it's probably a good thing to at least consider. 
right? And last but not least, bishops are actually really good at creating mating nets in certain types of positions. It's particularly common when your opponent's uh, has castled on a particular side of the board. They've pushed up the G pawn in front of the king. If you can get your bishop into either of these squares, a lot of times you can create a mating net. And so for example, in this position, bishop to f6 is a really strong move because what it does is it completely cuts off the king from escaping. And we're actually setting up a really nice tactic here. If black doesn't stop us, let's just say black plays a move like, I don't know, uh, maybe knight b4. Uh, they just lost the game, and if you want to pause and figure out what can we play now as white. All right, if you've had a chance to look at that, the move is rook takes h7. And so this is a common mating pattern where if black tries to take it, we simply slide this other rook over, check, forces the king back, and then we get this really nice uh, mate here in the corner. So this all started because that bishop, like I said, is completely trapping black's king, right? So it's Number one, uh, stops the king from moving forward. Number two, it stops this pawn from moving forward so the king can't escape that way. Number three, uh, if the king tried to run like over here, um, for example, you know, like this, guess what? It's still stuck, right? The bishop is stopping that. So this is also checkmate. So that bishop is very, very powerful. And, uh, you know, at this point it's too late. What black would have had to do is play like h5. Still not a good position because we can take it and then they have to play like yeah, I guess the, the engine is saying black can somehow survive and not get checkmated here, but it's, I mean, it's not good. Because once this pawn gets captured, that's really when the king can now has a place to escape, so it's no longer checkmate. But still, um, it's, it's not good news for black. So whenever you have the opportunity going back to put your bishop in one of these places, look out for that. It's usually going to be pretty good, and a lot of times you can get these mating nets um, if, you know, you're, you're on the lookout. All right, guys, that's 11 ways to use your bishops more effectively. Let me know if I missed anything. As always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.